Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Berit, for uh, this organization and for the invitation. Um, <coughs> I am an uh, assistant professor at uh, the Radboud University in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I work mostly with innovation, technological change, but I work very closely with uh, Cambridge Econometrics, and we have Hector Pollitt back there who spoke yesterday uh, about the E3. I, we work with the E3ME model, although. Um, I am also affiliated to Cambridge University where I was for the last five years, so some people might have heard of me through this affiliation. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, what we've been doing in the last few years, which was to develop the E3ME model into a broader integrated assessment model that, that involves connecting different areas of research, including the climate sciences, for example. So it's become a bit of a community around this. I mean, the E3ME model is uh, mostly known for impact assessment at the European uh, level, but uh, increasingly used for different purposes as well, and, and it's becoming more and more interesting, I think, and also given the, the community that's developing. Now, it differs from other models primarily by the fact that it's simulation-based, and that makes a big difference to uh, the type of analysis that we do, but I think appropriate for impact assessment. And it may be useful sometimes when we think about models to situate models as to where they appear in the cycle of policy making, as to whether it's at agenda setting where it's normative, what should we be uh, aspiring to, and the impact assessment, which is what are, what are going to be the results of chosen uh, measures and policies. Okay, so that's just the team uh, between Radboud University, University of Cambridge, Open University for Climate Sciences, and the model is really based at Cambridge Econometrics, where, which, which works mostly in economics. Okay, so the model is complicated, so I'm just going to walk you through it. So let's go into... Okay, so the core really is macroeconomic core. It starts from the demand, the demand for goods and services, and energy carriers. From this, we calculate the emissions. But it's highly detailed, uh, very disaggregated in sectors and uses of fuel. But econometrics is not good to look at technology evolution because typically time series are very short. So we use, use a different method. Uh, this is where I came in. So we look at every emissions intensive sector. We disaggregate, disaggregate it into uh, technology diffusion models. So these are individual models of diffusion of technology. So you've got the power sector, trans road transport, and then new ones are being developed for industry. We have one for households and uh, a new uh, land use model. This is constrained by another simulation of energy uh, use, natural resource depletion and energy prices. Then we just use some assumptions over policy and run this as a simulation to get environmental impacts. So, so you can never know whether anything's optimal because there, there isn't a single optimization calculation. And then we give this to the climate model to get a climate impact and soon this will be developed the uh, link back to the land as a sort of a, when rainfall changes if the land productivity is changing which may affect the agricultural sector. Okay, so I'll, I'll start backwards, but quickly, without too much detail, and then please ask questions or come talk to me later. Uh, we integrated the, this team of uh, climate scientists some years ago who work on the Gini, Gini Plus and model that keeps developing. That's a climate model, climate carbon cycle model of intermediate complexity. The, the advantage of doing this is instead of using a pattern scaling model like Magic C that lots of people use to know the uh, uh, climate impacts of what they're doing. Uh, this is the full simulation, except that it's intermediate complexity, which means it runs in quite a manageable time, which is a few hours. How do we use this? Well, this model is, represents quite well what the bigger uh, GCMs produce. We run it under a number of variations of its parameters, and we can figure out what is the spread of outcomes in order to figure out, for example, what level of probability we have of reaching a certain target. So here you have, you've got the 80% chance of two degrees, so we have emissions from E3ME going in the climate model, 
and then we, we figure out each run, how many runs are in each range. And we have done similar work for the oncoming discussion on 1.5. So we have a 1.5 scenario. <clears throat> okay, please ask questions about this um, to me later if you want to know. This is not the primary uh, I interest. Um, what is the E3ME model? So that's becoming quite uh, uh, ambiguous sometimes what exactly it is. It does so many things, I suppose. But really, it's a macroeconomic model that has an energy, a large energy subcomponent. Subcompon it calculates emissions of all pollutants and technology changes uh, what are the intensities in this model. Um, if I look at more detailed, it's uh, a simulation macroeconomic model ba based on post-Keynesian framework, and uh, that's a bit long to explain. But effectively, optimization is not assumed. It's not a computable general equilibrium model. It is a closed system of econometric equations that covers, for example, employment, investment. These are things calculated from the data out of regressions. Uh, over this is about 69 uh, sectors of industrial production, uh, 22 or so uses of fuel, and so on. Obviously, input-output tables. Uh, the key point is demand is not is 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 equal to supply by uh, that's uh, just an accounting identity. But demand is not necessarily equal to production capacity. Uh, it's always lower. Uh, the post-Keynesian world uh, of economics understands there to be uh, more capacity than what is used typically, so that if demand changes, it can produce it. That means that uh, if you look at the right the the red uh, last line there, it's under the right conditions, it's possible for regulation to increase output and employment. Depending, it doesn't always necessarily do this, but it's possible by the fact that there's people unemployed and there's unused capacity. Okay, now I go to the technology modeling, which you may be more interested in, uh, trying to give an overview. So, modeling technological change with econometrics is n doesn't really work. That's because the time series you'd use for the elasticities, they're short, it's by construction, this problem. Because if you look at new technologies, there isn't a lot of data. It's, it's a self-fulfilling sort of problem. So you look, we look instead in a cross-sectional way. So what we do is we look at, uh, over time, how technologies, how choices may make uh, te the technological sector change. So we have, for example, here, power sector and transport sector. And how this works is you look cross-sectionally at, so if you, if you look at the horizontal axis here would be a generalized cost if you put in all relevant uh, components in there, perceived by the agents. We consider agents to be heterogeneous, so these uh, perceptions are distributed. And then if we make comparisons of distributions, then we obtain a probabilistic choice. That's just a simple discrete choice theory framework. But then using this into a simulation, how each option that is competing with each other in a market uh, exchange shares of the market over time with um, these choices. So that gives us a, a simulation of technology. So that's an evolutionary economics idea. Uh, and it gives you sort of diffusion profiles by, by definition. So here you have, okay, we have sectoral models for power generation, road transport, household heating, and two more under constru construction for choice in agriculture uh, and industrial systems. <coughs> Should come online sometime this year or the next. Okay, so agents are heterogeneous, like I just showed. Um, so the adoption of innovations promotes further adoptions, and that is what gives you a diffusion profile. So the adoption is not an, optimized, an, op an optimal choice. It's a, a choice given by the, the preferences we calculate. Um, <clears throat> and then we have dynamic feedbacks with the economy, where if choice requires higher investment, like the low carbon transition is typically a capital intensive transition, so requires higher levels of capital that has deep implications in the economy. Uh, these models are, in fact, built inside the same code as E3ME, so that the, the, there's a full dynamical exchange. But 
maybe the highest, the biggest advantage of this methodology is that it uh, enables to define a lot of different types of policy instruments the way they might be defined um, legally. Uh, so you could have maps of policy, if you like, uh, that you could really explore, um, not just, for example, a price to carbon. Uh, in fact, we know f since the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement that it's li not likely to be a global carbon pricing that leads to the, the gl global decarbonization. So it's, it's becoming increasingly more demanding for modelers, but clearer that we have to look at pretty complex maps of policy. So that's what we've been doing. In fact, we work with uh, the Cambridge guys. They are uh, environmental lawyers, and they can tell us really um, what might uh, a real map of policy look like. And then we can put this into the model and see how we could reach uh, and have a real exchange with policymakers, not just at the EU level, because we do interact with uh, other governments elsewhere, for example, in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> So here you see the uh, um, uh, fractions of uh, emissions in each of these sectors. You see carbon pricing only covers the large emitters, while fuel, tax, fuel taxes could cover the other emitters. Typically, carbon pricing is not going to cover road, but you'll have fuel taxes. But obviously, other policies come in that are technology-specific or that are sector-specific, or um, they may be just regulatory uh, uh, tools. Okay, so, last slide. Um, <clears throat> not going to explain it in detail, but we have these uh, sector-specific technology diffusion um, um, calculations we do, simulated over time. You put in a map of policy and you get one of these. So the middle, well, the first column is the baseline. The middle column is the two degree, a two-degree scenario with 80% probability that we've calculated. The bottom row is um, emissions of CO2 for each of the, uh, I think, 22 uh, users of fuel. You see power sector is the big blue one at the bottom. It's always the largest, but we have every sector in there. And every sector has got policies we can put in, right? So it's really sector-specific. And we also have the last column is um, a 1.5 degree scenario that we've created. Um, Obviously, 1.5 is highly demanding for uh, the model because it's really radical, radically fast change. There's an issue about stranded assets that come in. Uh, maybe uh, plants need to be closed earlier than their uh, uh, lifetime uh, recommends. And these are all things we calculate. So um, I'll leave it there. And uh, please ask questions or come in, talk to us, myself or Hector, who's back there, uh, for more information about this if you are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francois, for a nice presentation and a good overview. I'm uh, very curious about the behavioral part of your modeling. Uh, and I'm going to ask the same question as I asked one time yesterday. Have you back-tested how, how good is the behavioral modeling that you have in this model? No, I think that's a problem that every modeling group has. Oh, well, I shouldn't speak only for ourselves. Uh, uh, we, to some degree, the econometrics, that uh, checking on data is sort of almost circular reasoning. So that's, uh, there's, we've done some effort by modeling a first half of data and then reproducing a second half, for example. For what is the technology modeling from the cross-sectional data set we need to cover over history, and that's something we are working on but it's rather challenging uh, but yes we uh, yeah i do take the point then the follow-up question is and uh, to what extent do you believe that the behavioral mod the behavioral aspects you are representing that they are represented in a good way and what makes you convinced that they are represented in a good way yeah it's by the fact that the model gives what you'd see as diffusion curves s-shaped diffusion curves um, <clears throat> that's not sort of prescribed by a particular choice of parameters. So you have a policy that comes in that uh, appears attractive and it will produce that. So the more people adopt the technology, the more it becomes available to be adopted. So there's lots of literature on diffusion. So that, that's really our starting point. That's um, where I think our model 
does well, and I think that it's partly by the fact that you, you don't use an optimization algorithm that you're able to get that. So in my view, I think it's an improvement o over using optimization as a description of, a, uh, of, of uh, you know, positive philosophy of science, how, how things actually work. Uh, Claudia Zabel from IR Stuttgart. Thank you very much for the presentation. What would you say are the main advantages and disadvantages of the A3ME model compared to CGE models? Okay, the, that's a thing that takes a long time to explain, so we can discuss can later. Can you make it a little bit? I'll, I'll just, <laughs> yeah. If, if you assume that uh, investment and physical capital is fully used from the starting point of the simulation, you are certain that well, by construction, your model can only give negative economic impacts of climate policy. And not to say that necessarily that there is an improvement we could do on the 3ME model to better understand this. I think reality lies somewhere between the CGE world and the post Keynesian world. But I think that ruling out the possibility by construction is can be slightly problematic. So that's. But I do know that, for example, the GEMI3 um, model has a lot of um, sophistication in that respect, and I think that that's a good way to look at the problem. And I think we come from the other end, and the two models are somehow uh, narrowing down the, the real possibility. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there one more question? Otherwise... If not, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of the panel.